welcome to the third episode of the Creative Wanderer podcast. Your weekly jaunt into creative inspiration. We are Joe and Amelia. Hello. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on your creative journey of recovery and discovery of your creative potential and talents. Yes, indeed. Today, we're going to be talking about week two of The Artist's Way, recovering a sense of identity. Oh, it's all about defining and safeguarding our creative identity and setting boundaries in the process. Yes, indeed. It's about recovery and emergence of long buried personal interests and desires, as well as looking at some pesky ways of sabotage that can creep up and stop our creative recovery. Oh, mm. we loved uncovering those, didn't we, Joe? We did. Dug them out. <laughs> kicked them out. If you're already in your artistic and creative recovery and you would like to have a creative co-conspirator, you can rely on us and you can do that in a number of ways. You can email us and let us know what you're enjoying or what you are struggling with. You can do that at creative underscore wanderer at yahoo.com. Please follow us on Instagram at creative wanderer. Just substitute part of creative with eight and the beginning of wanderer with the number one if you'd like to you can share pictures quotes you've been inspired by or affirmations which resonate with you so joe how was this week for you it was an eye opener wow i found it strangely both comforting as well as quite challenging Mm. it was both of those things i think for me it was that revelation of the poisonous playmates and the crazy makers how you are allowing people to sabotage you that That's true. I love my friends and by nature I'm always outwardly focused. I like helping people. Mm. A lot of the time I would just focus on others rather than myself. Those exercises and tasks that required me to stop and assess my life and see where I'm wasting my creative energy and deliberately focusing on others rather than focusing on myself. I found that quite challenging to do, but I did it regardless and learned quite a lot of things in the process. And also a lot of my creative time got liberated as well. That's really very good to know, isn't it? I found myself being quite surprised at how much time, like yourself, you would give away Mm -hmm. sometimes because someone else thinks that they need you. If you do help them, they've taken you away from it. You lose focus a little bit. That's not necessarily a poisonous playmate, but definitely a crazy maker. I'm not sure I enjoy the term crazy maker, but what they do is they try to unfocus you Mm. to focus on them. Mm. And that's frustrating. And also the fear of missing out. What happens if something hilarious happens and you've missed out on that joyous time with people and you've chosen to be your own person and be in solitude? But with your creative ideas and your creative identity, then you think, oh no, but they might be having a real laugh and I haven't been dancing for ages. Why didn't I do that? And that's the fear of missing out. It's taking you away from your focus. I could hear this voice in my head going, you should help. You've got to be good. Your friends need you. And it's just trying to find that balance between not stepping away from my social circle, but allowing myself the space to create. Your own social circle. Your sacred circle. This road is a road of recovery as well as discovery. So um, what I'm learning through this whole process, Joe, is just to relax into it and not to be judgmental when these feelings come up, which I feel might be a bit negative or they make me look like I'm not a good person quote unquote but it is just part of the process we are uncovering and digging out all the sludge and all the muck of layers and layers and layers of when we have denied ourselves to be creative it's true We've done that many, many times. I think that one of the most interesting things about this week was looking at all of the things that I enjoy doing, but I haven't been doing. Mm -hmm. The lists of hobbies, just doing anything, even if it's popping out to the shops, you know, for a mooch, all of those things. And I'm still not giving myself space and time to indulge my own creative self. Yes. My main reason for starting this journey, The Artist's Way, was to be able to find tasks and activities that I can do every day. And this chapter did that for me. And I was so grateful to realise that creativity is not something that is done in a large, huge, long chunk of time that we set aside once a week. Creativity happens every moment of our existence. It's all about being receptive and open-minded. Were you looking for artistic rituals little rituals you could do every day I quite like the idea of that they're habits but I don't really want to call them habits 
I think habits always for me seems quite negative but if it's a daily ritual I think it feels like it's something that's really empowering you or yes. giving something to you that's joyful we are very happy to start looking at how do we define ourselves as artists are we happy to be called a creative or an artist or does that make us slightly uncomfortable well, it does make some other people feel uncomfortable when you say you're an artist or you're a creative. I think creative has had so many connotations, like an art director at a marketing agency. Right. Like the creatives. So it's been given a corporate connotation mm. in a way. We are creative, so I'm a creative, you're a creative. I think it's interesting once you start to trust your creativity, mm. you know, when you start to go sane, which feels like you're going insane. Yes, you start becoming quite erratic. And I've noticed the symptom of going sane. My life, my creative life has become sanely erratic. <laughs> it really has. There are so many things happening in one day that I do creatively nowadays. It feels like this tornado or a hurricane sweeps yeah. through my flat when I'm done. But it is very interesting when you think that you are really making inroads into your sanity. But to get there, you go a bit bonkers. You feel like you're in free fall. You do. You don't feel safely anchored to something. Yeah. As we start feeling stronger in our recovery, we experience self-doubt self-attacks and self-sabotage. But these are recovery symptoms. They are. There will always be that critical voice inside of you telling you you're not good enough. We yeah. call it the sensor. The sensor. How dare they? As soon as you start <laughs> doing your creative task, you start thinking, you start judging. And Julia uses this fantastic term. She says, avoid the first think. Just continue and carry on with whatever creative activity you're engaged in. And what will be, will be. That's right. So Joe, how did you find it? Did you find any of your saboteurs, those little voices coming up telling you you shouldn't be doing what you're doing? I didn't find a saboteur talking to me about not painting. I think that I've probably sabotaged myself when it comes to writing mm. because I've put it back and put it off. And I wonder why I've done that. So that's kind of maybe not vocalised sabotage mm. but it's silent sabotage i've silently sabotaged myself possibly by focusing on another creative outlet but i know that this also has to get out and it's just spending the time and focus on doing it and saying to my silent saboteur you can go away now it's interesting what you said there in terms of not vocalizing and articulating this whatever is blocking you. There is a remedy for that. Mm. Now, when you do hear yourself saying to yourself, no, no point in even starting this. Who am I to think that I'm a creative or an artist? Yeah. The remedy is... Your daily affirmations. Joe's favourite, and she's so good at those. We talked about that last week, and I love them. So please, if you have any favourite affirmations, maybe one you've read or ones you've made up, let us know. Email them to us, or even better, pop them on a picture, whack them on Instagram. Ooh, that would be lovely. What we are curious about is to see how you are reframing your negative self-beliefs and censoring chitter-chatter into a positive affirmation. The one that is absolutely true to you and how you make it your own, because that's very important when it comes to affirmations. It certainly is. Julia's Pearls of Wisdom. We <laughs> love a Julia's Pearl of Wisdom. Creativity flourishes when we have a sense of safety and self-acceptance. So, Amelia, those poisonous playmates, those friends who are, hmm, they look like they're all lovely on the outside, but they're not really that keen on you flourishing, are they? What's interesting about poisonous playmates, as well as this whole chapter is that it's very gentle in its approach we are not pointing fingers at anyone well <laughs> well we kind of are <laughs> well the thing is we recognize that poisonous playmates are blocked are themselves blocked artists indeed they are so very often the comments that we receive from them or observations or even judgment they are done in such a way that they don't understand that the blocked artist or a blocked creative in them is speaking to us. Yes. And as Julia says, one of her pearls of wisdom, creativity flourishes when we have a sense of safety and self-acceptance and a poisonous playmate probably isn't feeling safe and hasn't found self-acceptance. I found when it comes to poisonous playmates, you can put up with so much and then you kind of have to say no. This is where this whole idea of setting boundaries mm -hmm. comes in. Recognising who is your champion in your life yeah. or who is the monster and then be gentle 
but firm in drawing a sacred boundary around your creativity, your creative work, and knowing who's in that circle and who is outside the circle with love, without pointing the finger of blame. That's actually one of the tasks, drawing the circle and putting people in the circle or outside of the circle. Are you in or are you out? <laughs> a poisonous playmate can be your best friend, your mother, your father, your family, your teacher. It doesn't matter. You'll recognize them by the fact that they are sabotaging your creative recovery and your creative expression. They are threatened by our creative recovery. Now, it's very interesting why they're threatened. Because you remind them that they have a responsibility to take care and nurture their own creative expression. They themselves are probably amazing creatives. But what we're learning about a creativity on this journey is that creative expression requires taking risks and being authentic. And that's not easy to do. The poisonous playmates as well, what they tend to do is they can be watching the TV. They can look at some creative expression and believe that they can do better, although they're literally doing nada. Yes. So it's just that little defense mechanism within that person that's speaking mm -hmm. out or speaking up. But I would not take it personally. That's what I've learned through this chapter. Because yes, in your creative recovery, as you're digging out all your poisonous playmates and realizing who they were throughout your life, and perhaps you still have some that you connected to, you might get a bit angry, a bit like you want to lash out at them, wag your finger at them, tell them <laughs> off. But you can't. Because when you recognize that they themselves are in the same predicament that you you were until recently, until mm -hmm. you started this recovery, then there is this sense of acceptance and love. So how do we move through, navigate through the poisonous playmate playground? We have to place ourselves and our artist with safe, loving companions, people who really get us, people who are not out to get us. We talk about this all the way through the book, actually. It's all about who you are allying yourself with to make sure you're not criticised constantly or brought down or made to feel guilty or manipulated. They like to share their well-meaning doubts with you. You know, well, what you're doing is lovely. But it's not like you're going to make any money from it. And they kind of don't want you to be successful. They look like they're trying to make a wonderful, positive statement about you. But it's all backhanded compliment. Yeah, I've been you there. Know? I've got the badge as well. <laughs> I've been on the receiving end. But you know what? I'm not going to lie to you. I've also been myself a shadow artist and a poisonous playmate. Haven't we all? Haven't we all? Let's just be honest. Oh, We're yeah. not saints Aww. and exactly and <laughs> angels because we at any stage of our life can be at any stage of this creative recovery and discovery. It is about accepting where we are and moving forward mm -hmm. by doing. I usually recognize that I've been on the receiving end or I've allowed to doubt myself if I start experiencing frustration in my life. Mm. I get creatively frustrated. Something doesn't fit. I'm just not happy or I get blocked. All of a sudden I just can't write or can't read. I trip over the words. It's weird. So there is a beautiful quote that Julia put in the book. It's by Shakti Gawain. And it says, Every time you don't follow your inner guidance, you feel a loss of energy, loss of power, a sense of spiritual deadness. We've all been there. Amelia, you and I are on the recovery path of moving from self-doubt into self-expression. And you found it very healing and gentle. And I feel like for a lot of my life, I've been on this path without knowing it. I've been through self-doubt on many different levels and then chipping away at the constant barrage of self-doubt, of self-sabotage. A lot of people are frightened of being successful. Mm -hmm. You sabotage yourself because you never know. You may be incredibly successful. And what happens then? We tend to catastrophize. We tend to project the worst scenario ever, even with the most positive projection of success and think that's just too scary. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty, Joe. This is what this chapter is all about. Finding these silly voices inside of our heads that we've actually labeled silly, but they're quite serious. But we think that's such a silly thing to think about, right? But those are the ones that we want to drag out of the shadows and shine a light on and say, why do I feel like that? Why am I so judgmental and so unloving towards my talent, towards my artistic expression? It's that feeling of camaraderie, knowing that other people have felt exactly the same way throughout their lives and you're not going crazy. 
and it, it's okay to go through it. It's not self-indulgent to go through it. It's not, oh, woe is me or self-pity. It's none of that. It's a process. There's often light and dark necessary to make you a creative being. Both you and I found one particular paragraph very helpful when it comes to using remedy tools. We'd like to read that paragraph to you. The paragraph also leads to the rules of the road. So Julia does have a beautiful way with words. This is the paragraph we're talking about. Draw a sacred circle around your recovery. Give yourself the gift of faith. Trust that you are on the right track. You are. As your recovery progresses, you will come to experience a more comfortable faith in your creator and your creator within. You will learn that it is actually easier to write than not write, paint than not paint and so forth. You will learn to enjoy the process of being a creative channel and to surrender your need to control the result. You will discover the joy of practicing your creativity. The process, not the product, will become your focus. Your own healing is the greatest message of hope to others. That's wonderful, isn't it? It is indeed beautiful. It's so gentle and so soothing. But Julia doesn't stop there. She doesn't stop at all. No, 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 no. I mean, we're going on a wander, aren't we? What are the rules of the road? Oh my goodness, I've just connected the two. We are, after all, the creative wanderers. Wanderers. (laughs) She sets out the rules of the road for you to use when you travel on that road of recovery and discovery, it says. In order to be an artist, I must. One, show up at the page. Use the page to rest, to dream, to try. Two, fill the well by caring for my artist. Three, set small and gentle goals and meet them. Four, pray for guidance, courage and humility. Five, remember that it is far harder and more painful to be a blocked artist than it is to do the work. 6. Be alert always for the presence of the great creator leading and helping my artist. 7. Choose companions who encourage me to do the work, not just talk about doing the work or why I'm not doing the work. 8. Remember that the great creator loves creativity. 9. Remember that it is my job to do the work, not to judge the work. And 10. Place this sign in my workplace. Great creator, I will take care of the quantity. You take care of the quality. Fabulous. We've already touched upon the second type of a saboteur, the crazy makers. They make you crazy. We all know who they are. Oh, we certainly do. We've got special words for them. Well, there are a few choice words for them. There are a few choice words that we can't say, but the ones that we can say, they're difficult people. They have challenging personalities. They're attention seekers. Drama queens. Divas. They're self-centered and egotistical, but they are also blocked artists. So so that is very important to remember. We always come to the place of understanding where other people are attacking us from. They're blocked creativity. You don't just have to shout expletives at them. No, you don't. Don't. Profanity. Uh, well, maybe in the past, but now we know better because we've realised what is going on. The same as the poisonous playmates, the crazy makers are also external blocks. But we are allowing it to happen. I Ooh. call them master saboteurs because they are energy suction machines. <laughs> I love that. Do you? you haven't used energy vampire. Energy suction machines. I just had this, all. you know, suction <laughs> little pads. Yes. They do. They, they really suck all the life force, all the energy that you have out of you. And onto them. What was really a huge eye opener for me was the fact that they feed off other people's creative energy. Yep, they do. They love it. It's delicious to them. It's scrumptious, especially when it's shining bright. These people are magnetized to you and they want to take that for themselves and happily dim your light. Because you're taking responsibility for your own creativity, you're taking attention away from them. Mm -hmm. And so they will try and suggest that you have caused a problem to them and for yourself by something that's completely not related in any way, shape or form. Yes. Crazy makers, master saboteurs, love power. Mm. And love those systems or those people who are happy to give them that power. It's not all their fault, because if you are 
creatively block to such a degree that you really do not want to look at your artistic expression, creative authenticity. You're not willing to take responsibility for it by going out there and taking all these, you know, knocks on the chin because let's face it, you'll get attacked. That's just the universe we live in. It's not favorable towards artists, but do we care? No, we don't. We just go out there and keep on creating. You know you have really creatively blocked when you are allowing a master manipulator in the guise of a crazy maker to actually drive you crazy because they create Julia says storm centers around them they do they always rock up with a suitcase full of problems and they expect you to solve those problems they never offer up any solutions the real question is why on earth are you putting up with it why are you doing it because being a block creative you will go to extraordinary lengths to remain blocked because of the fear of the unknown the fear of your actual potential they do not like order or structure or schedules as soon as they see that you have started recovering your artistic expression and you have started recovering yourself as an artist or a creative they see you start putting in time for yourself for your creative expression they will try to disrupt that time they will actually encroach on your creative time on your creative order on your creative schedule and that's how you recognize them that's why drawing that sacred circle around your artistic activities creative activities is so important important it is we've talked about external blocks Mm -hmm. now amelia yes do we need to talk about inner blocks skepticism so joe what is skepticism well the dictionary definition of skepticism is a doubting or questioning attitude or state of mind doubt as to the truth of something skeptical meaning not easily convinced having doubts or reservations and it comes from the greek word which means to reflect look view which is nice actually to reflect look or view i guess it is a state of reflection yes but i think we very often look at it or use it in a negative connotation Mm -hmm, for sure we harbor this secret skeptic inside of us don't we joe we do even to do this course maybe you are skeptical about whether it'll work or whether you have the time Mm. i'm thinking about another phenomenon i guess in our human life and existence and it's called the imposter syndrome oh yes it ties into skepticism doesn't it when you feel that whatever you achieve all your achievements all your successes were not down to your talents and skills and your blood sweat and tears but were just due to luck Oh, it was a fluke. Yeah. Or even worse, you feel like you're a fraud. Mm, yeah. I had that. Did you? When I first started doing voiceover work, I was in this booth. I remember my first couple of jobs looking all professional in a professional recording studio with my headphones on, with this beautiful mic in front of me, with a bunch of producers sitting opposite you behind that glass. Talking about you. you, Talking about me, (laughs) telling you how to do it. Do it a bit faster, but a bit slower as well. (laughs) And I thought to myself, I'm winging it. I'm not sure I should be here. It's not a surprise. Apparently, 70% of population experience the imposter syndrome at some time in their life. That's a lot, isn't it? 70%. You've probably noticed some synchronicity popping up in your life by now. Many things. On this journey. What can happen if we allow this scepticism to go unnoticed is that all the help that the life force, the universe, the great creator, however you want to call it, I call it the life force because Mm. we're all part of this dynamic of life. It'll start giving you small gifts, these small parcels of help. Mm. will start arriving don't doubt them they are part of your artistic recovery just grab them and run with them and welcome them and say thank you yes it is you who is creating those beautiful little breaks who is receiving those lovely tiny gifts a spark Mm -hmm. it's lovely so joe how do we deal with skepticism then you can park it aside put it in the car park and just (laughs) get on with your day i guess it is as simple as that Yes. Listen to the creative within you. And now that we've parked that scepticism, it is time to take in the scenery. So, Amelia, this is my favourite part of the podcast when I ring my feng shui bell. Ah, that was lovely, wasn't it? A little moment of serenity and peace. It always makes you feel re-centred, that bell. Hmm. Time to take a creative stop. A moment of contemplation on our journey. 
this is the time for us to ask you to reflect on your own creative expression and creative life. Absolutely. Do you still have any doubts that it's okay for you to be creative? Do you doubt the quality of your creative work? Are you still surprised when other people appreciate your creativity? And do you think that they are insincere in their praise? Oh, that's a good one. Something to think about, isn't it? Yeah, there are so many remedy tools to fall back on. After this lovely creative moment of reflection, we are moving on to the section that Joe loved in particular. It is beautiful and it's about attention. Julia says in one of her pearls of wisdom, the truth is that a creative life involves great swathes of attention. Attention is a way to connect and survive. Wow. To be in the present moment, you have to be paying attention. Mm. And that's where all of the good stuff happens when you're present. Being in the present moment in present time is what gives you the tools to be a creative person. Even if you're not actually doing the Artist's Way course, seek this chapter out. Read this section because mm. it is gorgeous. Julia talks about her grandmother being a gardener and every day she saw something new and something beautiful in her garden. She was aware of every single bit of nature that happened. And I love that. There are certain sentences and certain small snippets of mm. imagery that I underlined in that particular section. For example, life is a series of small miracles. You've got to savour life's small chances. And the one that I love, 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 my grandmother stood knee deep in the flow of life and paid close attention. What I love about the word attention, and you know, I'm a stickler for words and I love the derivations. It comes from a Latin word, which means to stretch. You've got to stretch yourself, your attention, your eyes, your ears out into the life itself, into the outer world. Stretch your senses. I did not know that that's where it came from, actually, mm -hmm. to stretch. I think that people, oddly enough, misunderstand. I certainly do the word attention. I have often perceived it to not be stretched. I've often perceived it to be focused, attention to be focused mm -hmm. rather than attention to be expanded. It's your expansion, isn't it? To stretch it all out so you can feel it, see it, taste it, smell it, touch it. She's also used this lovely term that healing begins in the act of paying attention. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, it's very true as well. And that attention is an act of connection. And it's so important to do that because when you're then looking at somebody and paying attention and them having their attention on you, that connectivity is so beautiful and is a way to heal mm. not just your creative self, but yourself and each other. And I personally, I'm always passionate about that, nurturing that sense of connection outside the artificial intelligence, outside these smartphones, bringing ourselves back to this rootedness of being in each other's presence, just being, being, being in the now. So what is the remedy, Amelia? The remedy is to find ways to bring ourselves to the present moment every day. To breathe, to connect to one's breath. That's right. Go within. Go within to be aware of what is without. When you find yourself scattered, unsettled, perhaps pressurized, worried, close your eyes, feel that breath in your lungs, feel that exhale the breath leaving your body and immediately you will feel much calmer and in the present moment. It is such a simple remedy and because it's so simple I think most of us tend to forget it on a daily basis. Yes we do indeed. This ties in with a beautiful quote that we also would like to read. It is by, if I remember correctly, Eddie Cantor. I have found it. Slow down and enjoy life. It's not only the scenery you miss by going too fast. You also miss the sense of where you're going and why. Wow. Oh my word, Amelia! We're about to pull into the inspiration station! Toot toot! What inspired you, Amelia? It was all about being in the present moment and the present time. It's Crystal Ball by a lovely actress, Viola Spolin. What a name. Mm. She wrote this lovely book called Theatre Games for the Lone Actor. And this is what she wrote about present time. To the witch she did go, to find out what the future holds, and to the seeker the following was told. Present time you must find, and within it dwell, for in there is the key that opens the door to the great mystery, and the future you will see. But hark, if in present time you cannot dwell, you'll have no future to foretell. Trapped in the past you'll always be. So she went forth to dwell in present time. 
But alas, present time, like the divine, is most difficult to find. Very beautiful indeed. So what was your uh, inspiration so, this week, Jill? This week I found a little card that came with a piece of jewellery that my lovely mother-in-law bought for me a few years ago at Christmas. And it was made in Ireland by a beautiful artist called Maureen McGee. And she has drawn on the front of it the picture of the necklace and it's made from ancient, like thousands of year old Irish bog oak and inlaid in it is a piece of copper that's been patinated. And it's very pretty. I hadn't actually worn it until the other day and I found the card. And in it are two things. This beautiful Khalil Gibran quote. In one drop of water are found all the secrets of all the oceans. In one aspect of you are found all the aspects of existence. (laughs) And then there's one other piece that's beautiful and it's on the back of the card. And it's On Beauty by Frederick Turner. A beautiful thing, though simple in its immediate presence, always gives us a sense of depth below depth, almost an innocent wild vertigo as one falls through its levels. I love that. There is that sense of connection when we connect to beauty and it's almost like time and space disappears. Everything just stops and everything is in that state of suspension. Mm, And you're just absorbed by that thing. I love your inspiration station moment this week, Jo. It's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. Likewise. Well, this is also an invitation for you to share your own inspiration station moments should you wish you know how to contact us we now move amelia on to the very well put together as every week is tasks oh yes and there are 10 tasks i know that we both really like the life pie i love the life pie mine was very lopsided oh yes i think that did change ever so slightly because you 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 get asked to do it again and mine it wasn't quite so lopsided but also it's still very much a spider it made me reconnect with quite a lot of my old friends which is really beautiful that's very nice indeed. Yeah, because that part of the pie was rather... Well, there was, there was no <laughs> pie there, actually. It was just a crust. It was just a crust. <laughs> <laughs> no filling. Uh, no filling. So there you go. I'm sure you'll all agree that the tasks are absolutely fabulous. None of these tasks or the way to do them is set in stone. I believe, Amelia, what has happened is that we've come to the end of another podcast. Have we? We have. It feels we like have. we've just started. And that's because you and I could talk for England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Croatia and all of the, you know, the whole of the world. Exactly. All the neighbouring countries. Indeed, indeed. So coming up next week, week three. Ooh, yes. It's a dynamic week. We'll be dealing with recovering a sense of power. <sighs> we'll be dealing with emotions such as anger, shame and criticism. I cannot wait to step into my creative power with you and with you guys. So thank you so much for joining Amelia and I and we hope that you have fully enjoyed this episode of The Creative Wanderer. Thank you for wandering with us and remember to always be on the lookout for the presence of wonder. See you next time. Music